Welcome to All Things Moore County, Moore County's weekly radio show highlighting the many facets of the Sand Hills. That includes real estate, lifestyle, community and neighborhoods. And now from Four Properties, here's your host, Bill Sahadi. Good morning, Dorothy. Welcome to All Things Moore County. Um, and compared to where we sat a year ago at this time, it's a pleasure to um, welcome spring. Oh, yes, it is. And talk about some spring events. Talk, Finally, something's going on out there. Yeah, and talk about some of the um, iconic organizations that were always at the forefront um, of moving Moore County forward. Um, so it's been a while since we've had Chris Dunn mm -hmm. um, from the Arts Council of Moore County on, but Chris is with us today, and a guest lecturer, Ellen Burke, who is a resident of Pinehurst, I believe, is here as well. We're going to be talking about the, um, the Arts Council's Arts Lecture Series, which starts at the Sand Hills Community College on the 23rd of March, and there are going to be four separate lectures, mm -hmm. lectures running through May the 18th. So that's the reason for the show, mm -hmm. but there's more than that for the show because the Arts Council of Moore County is, I feel, and I said to you this, Chris, mm -hmm. it seems like every year we're talking to a, a new demographic coming into town mm -hmm. who may not have the same awareness oh, yeah. of a, an organization like um, yours, oh, yeah, the Arts Council. They... Um and that's what helps us out. We we have a lot of children show uh, children's events in the schools, yeah, which is where their children would see that most likely. But right now, with like our current exhibit is the Young People's Fine Arts Festival, and every day now we're bringing in more and more families just to come see the art, or they may have art on the wall, which is it's kind of exciting for them when they come into a real gallery and they can see their art up on the wall, lit and all that sort of thing. They love that. For people who are not aware of the Arts Council mm -hmm. and what they do, yeah, um, people will be aware of the beautiful building, right, th on Connecticut. Yep, they look to the right and they go, huh, "What's that? <laughs> yep, what is in there?" Oh, it's a full functioning gallery, a sales gallery. We show. Um, it's called the Campbell House Galleries, That's and right. it's a town. It, the town, the property is owned by the town of Southern Pines, but we rent the first floor which is where the gallery rooms are. And we've been there for 30 plus years. It's a great home, easy place to work at. Um, so we're right across the street from Weymouth Center, which I know you're gonna be talking to Katie sometime. Yes. And um, it's it's open 10 to five every day, weekdays, and then the third Saturday in um, of the month. And that's where our offices are, but the gallery is the, is the focal point there. And not unlike the Weymouth Center, it's open to the public. Exactly. We're open to the public. It's free to come in. A lot of people want to know. It's a little bit imposing to come into that huge house and think, can I go in? But you can. It's free and open to the public. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Torin Wright. Yes, Torin, yeah. He did his last um, production. Yeah. <laughs> and we reminisced a little bit because mm -hmm. way back in 2001, oh, yeah. I brought a singer here from New York I remember that. Um, Jane, Jane Oliver. Yes. She was a cross between Edith Piaf yep. and Barbara Streisand. Yeah. At the time when she was in her heyday, mm -hmm. she was a big deal. She wasn't a big deal, though, for very long. <laughs> right. And she came and she performed. And when she came here, um, she was at the Robert E. Lee Auditorium. Yeah. It was for a 9-11. But when she arrived in Moore County, we had a lunch set up at the Campbell House. I don't. Re I remember us talking about her. I don't remember the lunch. I'm glad you did. So we had a committee. Uh, we had about six or seven right. um, people from Moore County. We had a, a welcoming committee. And all I can tell you is the setting in that room, in the Campbell House, yeah. overlooking the fields, yeah. is like walking out of a vintage postcard. Oh, y y Yes. It is it is a great place. My first week when I I came here in '95. Yeah. And the, my first week it snowed. It was January and it snowed the perfect snow. So it's beautiful for like six hours and it's melted by five o'clock. <laughs> that was the perfect snow. Um, so I was like, I think I'm gonna like it here. And that was 
27 years ago or something like that. Yep. You were a musician. I am, yes. But, and I still are. Active. Play trumpet. I yes, I I play mostly locally around here in the community college jazz band, the concert band or community band. Um and in any church that'll hire me and uh, I do have a brass quintet that yeah, for my other friends, we we get together and play in churches and stuff and just have fun making music. Yeah. And um your guest Ellen Burke, mm-hmm. uh, who when I read a little bit about her, I was wanting to hear her accent because I thought she hailed from New England. Um, 37 years of experience as a studio instructor and um, art administrator. Yes. And, um, but you're not originally from New England. No, I'm not. I was born in the Bronx, New York. See, and, does she um, look like she's from the Bronx? <laughs> no. Do you know what and people look like from the Bronx today? <laughs> oh, my God. And grew up in the Hudson Valley. And I had my first teaching job in Cortland, New York, which is the heart of New York State. And um, I've shared this with Chris before, but I attribute the Arts Council uh, in Cortland, New York, for for reaching out to me as a young teacher and providing amazing experiences for my students. And as an arts administrator, a lot of times your budget will not handle the extra things that you'd like to do, the bus to go to a museum, mm-hmm. or, um, and it was the arts councils that provided that support. So I, when I moved here, one of the first things that I did was, was check out the arts council and, and eventually find ways that I can be involved. So it's been a wonderful growth for me. Remember that old TV show, What's Your Line? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you had the, the they were blindfolded, mm-hmm. the guests. And if she was the guest, and they had to guess where she was from, nope. how many people do you think would say she was from New York City? Yeah. None. <laughs> Not a one. If you listen to her, there's nothing about your, your diction or no. anything. Um, I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> it, it's a very good thing. I, um, I was all prepared to ask you, because you spent time in New Hampshire, the New, New Hampshire Art Institute, mm-hmm. um, and teaching in Massachusetts. I thought, oh, she found a connection here in Pinehurst with her New England roots, and that was the reason she made the switch, but that's not what it was. Well, (laughs) I moved from Cortland, New York, to Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is the smallest city in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It sits right on the Merrimack Merrimack River and looks out on the ocean, and um, at one time it was a very active port. So when I came to visit my sister and her husband here in Pinehurst about 12 years ago, um, I saw the village and I was like, Mm -hmm. this is a little New England. Mm -hmm. And um, I've described it to friends as a perfect little snow globe village without any snow. Right. That's exactly right. (laughs) It's perfect. We had a little shakeup this this, uh, January. But... So I felt um, that it was a place that I might be able to consider um, living. And, uh, and so I finished my teaching career in, um, in Massachusetts and uh, started teaching in, at the Art Institute of New Hampshire um, in the art education program, supervising student teachers. And when you came here, mm-hmm. did you come here with an eye on retiring? Um, reposing, just <laughs> enjoying life? Um. Well, I, I, um, the reason, one of the reasons that I moved, besides coming and visiting my uh, sister and her husband, and I had divorced a few years before right. this, um, I came down, we had two summers, or two winters on the seacoast um, with six feet of snow. And being brutally cold. And I was driving all over New England supervising student teachers. And I came down to visit my sister in March, and it was like full-blown summer. (laughs) I was like, what am I doing? So it's been a wonderful transition for me. All my friends in New England want to come here in March and April. And um, and I go up there in September. And and I have found my way here. um, uh, It takes a little time. Um, I miss teaching. Uh, so I got involved with homeschool groups and um, and now doing some private teaching. And, and you'll be one of the lecturers yes. during the series, mm-hmm. which we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. How did uh, you find this guy? 
Well, as I said, I, I was checking out the you know Arts Council in my new community and um, had the opportunity to connect with, with Chris and, and some others on mm-hmm. a couple of things. And then through other people that you meet, you kind of start to find your place, how you can be... Um, how you can be of uh, support to them. Mm-hmm. And um, so I have done some plein air classes with them, uh, and we had great fun out on one of the beautiful horse farms uh, last spring. Um, I serve on the um, classical concert mm-hmm. uh, committee. Um, you were judging. Judging. You actually judged, <laughs> I judged just the, recently. Yes, I judged the, the uh, youth art exhibit, mm-hmm. um, okay. which was a wonderful experience because I, I, I did really love my job, and, and it's wonderful to connect with young people and, and their teachers and know that they're, they have an opportunity to show what they do. Um, and, you know, the last two years with COVID has been very difficult for teachers of any subject. Mm-hmm. But for the performing arts and visual artists, it's been it's hard to do that virtually. Yeah. As, um, Is this your first uh, participation in the lecture series? No, Ooh. I've done uh, a couple of years. <laughs> <Up> uh, <now. laughs> yes, yes. And um, and it's been a wonderful uh, experience for mm-hmm. me. And we've gotten you know, great support from the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had, um, when I first moved here, within the first year, I connected with Jane Casnelli, who's a local artist, and she had a gallery over by Elliot's, um, mm-hmm. Hollyhocks Gallery. And so in a conversation, Jane and I started talking about, um, because a lot of people will say that they like art, but they don't like going to museums. And that was one of my goals when I was teaching um In Massachusetts at the high school level, I wanted my students to feel like they were comfortable in a museum, that they had the language and the experience to enjoy it. And so uh, we really grew that that part of our program. And um, and that was based on my own childhood experience of you know living near Poughkeepsie, New York, and having my school district introduce me to ballet and the museums in New York and um, theater, things that my parents w- weren't able to provide for us. So in my teaching, I wanted to do the same for my students and, and have them be comfortable, welcomed and comfortable. And um, so it was kind of a natural fit. I started doing some um, lectures at, um, at Hollyhocks and then mm-hmm. was invited to do some with the Arts Council. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, Listening to her, you're by the way, you're a great speaker. Oh. <laughs> um, y- um, with all the students we've had on the show over the years mm-hmm. who get involved in the arts with their teachers, with their coaches or mentors, mm-hmm. one of the things they all say is, you know, not everyone at this table is going to go on to college and have a career in the arts, right. but as students, they're going to learn an appreciation mm-hmm. for the arts, yeah. And you it's are very important. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And just in recapping your experience as a, as a student at Poughkeepsie mm-hmm. and the influences that you had, mm-hmm. y- you are the result. You are the final result of what that appreciation looks like. Mm-hmm. When I moved to the school district in Massachusetts, they had a music program and a visual art program, and. When I became department chair a couple years mm-hmm. later, I tried to take the model of what I experienced in my growing up, because New York State at the time, as you may know, um, all children were to experience a full, yeah. <laughs> even a school <laughs> in Cortland, New York, which is was mm-hmm. at the time in the 1970s, mid-70s, an impoverished area. Yeah. Full orchestra, full mm. band, <clears throat> theater program, um, mm-hmm. The only thing we didn't have was dance. And when I went to Massachusetts, I was a little stunned. But through introducing the school and the community to what was possible by grant writing and bringing performing artists in, and I focused particularly on performance because it was so weak, um, we expanded to have um, 
a full theater program, um, orchestra. It took me 10 years to build an oh, orchestra. Wow. <laughs> um, expanded our band, percussion and mallet program, full jazz. Um, and, uh, and the community started to respond mm -hmm. to what was being offered in the schools. And expect and, it. And expecting yep. it. Mm -hmm. And so then, unlike years before, <laughs> you know, parents and 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 community members would show up at school committee meetings when they were talking about right. possible cuts, which always seems to be first. The first slice mm -hmm. is in generally in the arts. And so, um, you know, the benefit of that, besides seeing your dream come true with a lot of hard work, um, <laughs> is seeing kids find their voice. When they find their passion, right, right. and that reflects <laughs> on you. I, they did it. Mm -hmm. But for their families, they think that you were really pretty special. So yeah. I had a, a, an amazing career. Once, um, once a teacher, always yeah. a teacher. Yes. <laughs> Can't stop. Uh, it's in her yeah. DNA. Yeah, it's in yeah. her yeah. DNA. I, yeah. I had a similar experience. That I, I came from a, the student side. I had a teacher uh -huh. just like her, passionate about what they teach, passionate about what you're learning and how are you using that going forward, whether that be – I mean, I became, I was a music major in college, but I switched to business because I did not want to perform. Right. But I wanted to be able to hire people to perform right. and, and employ those artists that took that leap of faith mm -hmm. of, um, I'm going to pursue this career because it, it's where my passion lies, whatever art it might be. One, so I'm thankful for teachers like <laughs> Ellen, and I have several. One big picture question before we mm -hmm. wind up the first yes. set. Um. The cultural footprint mm -hmm. in Moore County has changed a lot oh, yeah. over the years. Uh, the role of the Arts Council of Moore County in that transformation? Yes. Uh, we started in 1973 when there was we were the very first arts organization, I think, that incorporated as a nonprofit organization. Right. And that was in 73. I think the Coral Society came a little after that, and Weymouth came a little bit after that. Um, now there are 15 to 20 nonprofit arts organizations in Moore County that uh, provide programming from preschool all the way to um, you're in your 90s if you're that active. Um, and it, there is a variety of it. So we do have quality theater. We have quality dance. We have quality chorus, um, music. Uh, we have opportunities for you to display your art and graphic design, or it could be painting and visual arts of any type. Um, and I came by it, I grew up in a similar situation, but I'm in, I'm from Eastern North Carolina, a small town called Snow Hill. And if it weren't for the people that grew up there and provided these opportunities for me to sing or, or play my trumpet or act on stage, which I hate doing cause I'm bad at it. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. Right. Um, this has given me a life beyond what I was expecting and that's why I've been here 27 years, which yeah. to me sounds like that's a whole lot of time, but it went by just like that. Um, yeah. But that's what the Arts Council is doing in, in addition to supporting Weymouth and the Sunrise and with grants or any kind of expertise that we, they need. Yeah. Um, especially during the COVID time, we were, they were, there was some money that was given to us from the recovery funds or recovery acts that we were able to give over to or grant out to these other organizations that we were very close to just folding. I mean, we were literally a month away from folding. Yeah. <clears throat> well said. Um, we're going to come back in the second set. We're going to talk uh, a little more in depth about the Arts Council's um, upcoming arts lecture series at Sand Hills Community College. Mm -hmm. This is All Things Moore County. Welcome back to our second set um, of All Things Moore County. Uh, the Arts Council is having a, um, a lecture series mm -hmm. starting at the Sand Hills Community College. You're going to have four, have four separate lectures between yes, March and May. Mm -hmm. And um, you've done this for how many years now? Since 2005, if I'm not mistaken. That was when Molly Gwynn and B.O. Rand um, came up with the idea, let's have a... a, a an, a fine arts lecture series. We've we've broadened it so it's now just an arts arts lecture series, 
and we first did it at, at Weymouth, and then we partnered with San Jose Community College and um, their McPherson Theater, mm-hmm. which is a black box theater that few know about yet, but it's across the breezeway from Owens Auditorium. Okay. Um, and what are people going to be um, seeing this year? Because oh. people are looking to get out and to do things. Yeah, this is, even if you're not scared, if, you, if you're, I don't know, if an arts lecture, you feel intimidated by them, this uh-huh. is not that kind of art lecture. You learn something. Every time I'm there, I, I'm not a visual artist, and I learn something from each one of them mm-hmm. that I go, I'm so glad I came to this. So we start with, with Ellen doing On the Brink of Modernism, the watercolors of John Singer Sargent. And that's on, I don't have the dates in my brain, but it's March 23rd at 4 o'clock at, um, at Sand Hills. We are full right now because of COVID limitations that Sand Hills has, but we think after spring break, that might open up, but we have a waiting list started, so just call Is the Arts right? Council. Ellen, why are people like me? I'm partial <laughs> to watercolor. Yeah. Why? I mean, no, I don't know why. I just, I know what I like, mm-hmm. but I can't tell you why. W- what do you tell someone like that? Well, I think you, you really kind of hit it that when we like something, we're responding to it, it res- whether it's the subject or... Um, but I think there's something about watercolor that's a little bit more spont- uh, spontaneous. And um, John Singer Sargent is a is a um, is really special to me. Um, both his work in portraiture and and in but his watercolors are are off the charts. They're they're just spectacular. Yeah. And um, a little background on him: he was born in 1856. To his dad was a um, eye surgeon in Philadelphia, but the parents had lost a child, um, and the mother convinced her husband that the only way she could recover was to move to Europe. And so they moved to Italy. She was and, smart. <laughs> and John Singer Sargent was born in Florence. And one of the things written about him was, if I can get this correct, he was an American, born in Italy, educated in France, lived in Britain, looked like a German, and painted like a Spaniard. Wow. So (laughs) he uh, was fluent in, I think, five languages and an incredibly charming young man. He also knew the family never moved back to the States. Um, He recognized at an early age that he was going to be responsible for the financial well-being of his family. And so instead of pursuing landscape painting that he had initially uh, started to pursue in his studies, in Paris he met uh, one of the foremost um, portrait painters at the time, and he began to see that as a way that he could generate um, income. Mm-hmm. And so his his portraits are spectacular. He does amazing jobs with children. Um, a couple of his paintings, um, he, he did, he was the, the portrait painter of the Gilded Age. So on both sides of the Atlantic, until in the late 1800s, I think it was 1888, he painted a portrait of a uh, an American woman living in Paris. And she was quite, uh, she was the Kardashian of uh, her Mm. age. And um, he painted her portrait. And in the portrait, she's standing. And the strap on her evening gown fell. Mm -hmm. And she was okay with him painting it that way. Mm -hmm. He asked his mentor um, what to do before it went into the big Paris salon. Should he repaint it? Uh Uh-huh. He did not realize that his mentor was becoming jealous of his success. The mentor said, leave the strap down. It created an international... um, Uproar. Yes, and he never was paid the commission. He lost all of his commissions going forward except for some friends in Boston and New York. And he then moved to England for a while. He moved to to, uh, London and spent time with friends in Broadway, which this is now the, um, you know, the Industrial Revolution, and so people are becoming nostalgic for villages, and so he's in this ideal setting, and he paints a painting called Carnation Lily Lily Rose, 
which was using children with Chinese lanterns in a garden at twilight. It's a gorgeous painting. It's at the Tate. The Tate bought the painting immediately, and his career was back on wow. track. The woman with the strap down never recovered from, <laughs> from this great uh, scandal. But um, after many years of success, he just felt like he was tired of the studio painting, tired of portraits. He said the best way to lose a friend is to paint their portrait. Now, some of his portraits are very familiar to us. Mm -hmm. um, Chris and I were talking about. He painted Teddy Roosevelt. He did. He did Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, oh, wow. Anyone who was anyone. Uh, um, Oscar Wilde. Um, okay. And uh, but he started to travel um, to Europe. Um, he started in Switzerland and would make his way down into Italy and finish in Venice um, in October. So he would be, in the summer months, he would be in Switzerland and then start to travel. He did not, he found such joy in these watercolors, painting them, and, and this different atmosphere. Painting plein air is a very different thing than painting in a studio right. because it's immediate and the light's mm -hmm. constantly changing. And... He didn't want to sell them. Um, he did 2,000 watercolors, and he didn't want to sell them wow. because they were a treasure to him. They were this, this vacation from um, the studio work and the pressures of portraiture. So many people were pushing him to sell these, and eventually he felt to that. He thought they were most impress impressive if they were seen together. So all of Venice seen together, or mm -hmm. or um, his his paintings from the Alps or the Usta Valley, or um, so. <clears throat> in 1909, the Brooklyn Museum purchased about half of them, oh, wow. and then um, uh, a few years later, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston painted the others. And um, there was something I just read last night that um, when he was holding on to these and not selling them, he would oftentimes give them to friends as gifts. So the, the story was that people would get engaged just so he would give them <laughs> one of his watercolors. And um, the thing about his approach is England was very famous for their watercolor artists. They were very... Um, very detailed, very um, strict in, in their rules about watercolor. And he blew the doors off of it. He approached them with such confidence and such immediacy. And one of the things that's so interesting is when you look at, and I will show this in the, in the presentation, the typical watercolor of Venice, let's say, for that period of time, and you would get the scope of the whole city. He's painting in a gondola. You're at water level, and he's looking up at these buildings, and he's taking small views so that you, you literally can feel the water lapping. If you've been to Venice, it's, it's just one of the most enchanting places, and the light is gorgeous. And these watercolors, I could do an hour presentation just on his uh, we'd, Venice paintings. We'd like you to. <laughs> this is mesmerizing. It's, it's, they're fabulous. And um, he took such joy in, in showing us the small things. His friends would write that when they would be hiking in the Alps, he would just run to a spot and plop down and set <laughs> things up and then just take it from there um, and show us something so intimate. The other thing I absolutely love about his watercolors is that he traveled with friends. So there are many... You know when you're traveling with friends, somebody's going to fall asleep in a chair, or <laughs> there are these wonderful um, sketches and watercolors of people he was very intimate with. And so I think it's a <clears> wonderful <throat> example of someone who didn't leave, um, sometimes artists, a Picasso, for example, he would, he would write about himself all the time. <laughs> but John Singer Sargent was a true gentleman. He was the perfect guest. He was he spoke many languages. He was tall and handsome and charming, never married, um, kept friends for for his lifetime. And um, just these watercolors are joyful. 
when you see them. Mm. They're so joyful. And in 2013 was the first time, um, and the exhibit traveled, but it was at, I saw it in Boston at the, at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts, brought the Brooklyn exhibit and Boston's oh, work wow. together. And of course, if you're at the okay. MFA, you also have the opportunity to see some of his um, murals, and which are, are spectacular as well. He developed very close relations with the, um, the people in both Boston and New York, particularly, who were working to start museums. Because in our country, major art museums were not founded until after the Civil War. Um, after the Civil War, a lot of Americans who had the means to do so left here and went to Europe and, and then were overwhelmed with this, you know, all the culture and the beautiful um, museums. And that's when museums like the Met and, and um, the MFA were started. And so he was one of the artists that really helped them in terms of what you should buy and, and um, uh, how you should be exhibiting work. Um. I started uh, this set by saying, just listening to her, <laughs> let me just tell you what just happened. What? I started this set by saying, I like watercolors, but I can't tell you why. I can now, after, after you know. listening to her, I can now, yeah. t- I can now tell you why. Yeah. No, I can't. You, if you love watercolor, <clears throat> find his work somewhere. Yeah. It's, it's so beautiful. It's the, the, the thing I like about watercolors, it's the spirit that's captured. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, up t- it's subject to interpretation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you're catching a moment in uh-huh. time. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's a wisp, and mm-hmm. and it it hits you, and it's a spirit, mm-hmm. and that's what I like about water. I didn't. Yeah. I can yeah. now answer that question. Yeah. So thank e- you for that. When he exhibited his watercolors in 1904 um, at the Royal Academy of Watercolor in England, one of the um, reviewers of that exhibit uh, quoted Shakespeare in saying that it was like an eagle in a dove coat. So in the sense that that this this creature came mm-hmm. in and took everyone by surprise mm-hmm. and that another reviewer said that the other watercolors next to his on the wall became just pieces of paper, that they <laughs> could not compete with the vibrancy yeah. um, that he approached uh, watercolor with. So why we, I called it on the brink of modernism is we think of someone like John Singer Sargent as being from the Gilded Age and this more more controlled work and that... Um, Picasso and Matisse and all of those, he's he was hanging out with Monet mm-hmm. and um, and they had great respect for each other. Um, he his when you see his watercolors and we'll we'll dissect a couple of them during the lecture yeah. as to how they they are crossing over. He is he is not giving up who he is, but he's crossing over um, into what's <clears throat> what's modern. Look at her penmanship. <laughs> <laughs> She speaks, and she writes as beautifully as she speaks. Oh, yeah. Looks like a calligrapher. Now, you know why we oh, asked her to be a lecturer. Goodness. <laughs> Hyper-organized. Oh, yeah. Um, you have just completely brought him to life. Oh, thank in, you. In, in this set. We're going to come back in the third set. We have a couple of other lectures we want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, this is All Things More County. We'll be right back. Thank you for that. <laughs> Welcome back to the third set. The uh, Arts Council of Moore County is um, about ready to host the first of four lectures in their 2022 lecture series, which will be held at the Sand Hills Community College. Yes, sir. Um, I think you need to order 300 more chairs <laughs> for the first lecture just based on the last set. Well, it only holds 88 people. 400 more chairs. <laughs> I wish. Um, but you have, actually, you have... Um, April 13th, May 4th, and May 18th, you've got three we do. other lectures. This there. is a series. Uh, we start with um, Ellen's our, uh, lecture on John Singer Sargent yep. on the 23rd. Um, and the one thing that we are known about is the variety of between the lectures. So the next one is called Brilliant Transformation, How African Metal Arts Inspired and Empowered African Lives. And we're having a, um, a lecturer come up from Gainesville, Florida, where she is, it said, curator emerita. She doesn't work there any longer. Is that what that means? Emerita? Oh, I don't well, she, I'm she's sure. at the Harns Museum in Gainesville, Florida. And she's coming up on April 13th to do this lecture. And it's about how 
the African metal artists, what they did and what they, the actual things they made, which some were sculptures and, and masks and things like that, what they meant to the people, how they were trying to impress about their grandness. I think that has, has something to do with it. Um, but let me, let me go ahead and tell you, I think I said the uh, first lecture is full with a waiting list. We're hoping the COVID limits will be lifted right after Sand Hills comes back from. 400 more chairs. Yes, you got it. <laughs> we might as well just move into Owens Auditorium, <laughs> which we can. So that's the next one. The, um, the third one is on May 4th, and it's called Design and Inspiration in Clay, and it features Fred Johnston and uh, Ben Owen, two very popular yep. uh, potters in the Seagrove area. Yep. And they're going to talk about how wood firing is done and they're on, on what it means in certain pots, how they're doing the this, this style, um, and talk about their probably family history in it. Uh, Fred has been here since the 80s learning about pottery, and Ben is probably the most well-known potter in North Carolina, at least. Yep. Uh, super nice guys. Uh, ben, I did not know this. I went to college at the same time he did at East Carolina. Never heard of him until I moved here. Is that right? So we're the same age, and I, it's always, I always like to see somebody from my alma mater do good. <laughs> I, I have He's, some of his pieces in my house. Oh, oh, yeah. Everybody gets is drawn to them. Oh, yeah. Um, you you didn't tell anyone anything. They just get drawn yeah. to those pieces. Yeah, I have about ten of his pieces. Beautiful, mm -hmm. and I never give them away. <laughs> they're they're mine. But um, that's going to be uh, May fourth. Uh, it's still got some space. Yeah. Um, hopefully, when the COVID limits are lifted, we'll have more space. And the last one is we're bringing back a, a lecturer we've had twice now. One or once or twice. Before. Amanda Maples, mm -hmm. who is a curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And hers is going to be New Masks Now, Notes from the Field. So she's been out in Africa collecting masks and other types of art from there. And uh, she's a curator of African art at the North Carolina Museum of Art. So this is her specialty. And she came back. Well, COVID stopped us the first time. That's why I thought mm -hmm. it was two times and we rescheduled and she was able to finish and she's a wonderful lecturer. So the lecturers are chosen because they are engaging. Mm -hmm. And then what they also bring is their expertise to show you something about something you didn't know anything about and to make you appreciate it more at the minimum, but to make you want to learn more. Mm -hmm. So that's each one of these uh, lectures are going to be like that. Uh, the cost per lecture is $26. You can get all four for 90. Students are free with advanced registration. They just have to call so we can reserve their space. Um, and all of them are going to be at San Jose Community College. And right now, seating is limited. But I've, I've gone to almost all of them through the years. Um, and I always come away from them with a lot more knowledge. Uh, I like the thing about John Singer Sargent that you told him these little <laughs> tidbits that you hear that n I didn't know. Any you would of never know. Right? No, I, I would know this about musicians, but I didn't know the visual artist had the same little <laughs> things going on in yeah. their life. You're like, what? <laughs> One thing I'd like to say about the African um, uh, lectures is what you'll see is the influence of African art. Pablo Picasso was very influenced mm -hmm. by so. Um, African pieces, particularly masks and sculptures. So there's that tie-in too with what we consider to be so modern is actually mm -hmm. from an, from more ancient works that yeah. um, it's always interesting to to pull those influences well, together. Yeah, and the one thing I find about visual artists, you I see it in music. There's music from all over the world that influences mm -hmm. other places in the world, and the same thing happens with mm -hmm. with visual arts probably does with writing and any other kind of creative expression but mm -hmm. uh, with visual arts you can draw lineage from you know 20th century all the way back to you know beginning of time really but that's just it's just interesting to see how parallel how visual arts parallels other art forms yeah. in that sense with um covid <clears throat> yes and everyone taking a year off so to speak <laughs> this lecture series is also um, a means of raising monies. Right. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the foundation, the Arts, Arts Council, and how it does? Oh, well, place? before COVID, we were on our way for a first balanced budget in quite a few years. Yeah. Um, 
But then when COVID hit, we had to cancel every concert, every lecture, every right. opening for our gallery. Right. Um, for a month and a half, we just we were not in the gallery. We were at home, every, all the staff members. And it got to the point where I think I told you before we started, we were a month away from shutting the doors. Right. Um, and our, you know, we, it's a pretty big budget for uh, an arts council. Um, but that that's what scared me the most. I didn't want to be the one at the helm and we went under. But um, so our funding comes from mostly from the programs that we do. Then we have sponsors, and I want to thank Four Properties for sponsoring the lecture series. I oh, think yeah. that's the first time you've done that. You've helped yes, us all yes. in the past with a lot of things. You have so. a couple of sponsors, too. That's <laughs> we do. We have okay. I, I'm, it's, I'm Sophie Moyle and Paula Weiss and then Four Properties. Yeah. So uh, we appreciate that support. So sponsorship is a big thing. We do a lot of grants. We do a membership. So you can be a member of the Arts Council. Right. And it starts at $45 or $60 for your family. You get 10% off at the gallery and, and things like that. But what it does is it keeps the Arts Council going, um, our members. And we, you know about everything we do before anybody else, which is kind of nice. Right. Um, so, but in addition to that, there's, if you take out COVID... Any money from the government was like 1%. COVID uh, brought in some funds from the CARES Act, from the, what was it, ARPA? I can't, no, Recovery, Build America. I can't remember what it was. But there's two things that um, the federal government did that finally the arts got some help. And we were able to give out grants to 15 arts organizations during COVID. And... Um, that helped, and I know PPP helped a lot of them too, but it was that kind of help that we needed during COVID. I was literally scared for looking for another job. What? Um, tell me about your plans beyond the lecture series for 2022. Oh, well, we've we had a classical concert series coming up on April 4th. We're going to be presenting the American Brass Quintet at the Sunrise Theater. Uh, that's at 8 o'clock. This is, this is probably the best brass quintet in the world. Huh. They are based, they're, I, I, not based, but I think they are of the official brass quintet at Juilliard School of Music wow. and the Aspen Arts Festival every year. So they, they are amazing. Um, tickets are still available. We are uh, adhering to some COVID rules, so there'll be a way to s spread out. So the other thing COVID did for us in terms of audience is we... Um, there are people who are afraid to get COVID, so they wear the mask and all that, or that. Or, I'm sorry, they don't go out because they're afraid to get COVID. Right. Then you got people who are tired of the COVID precautions and they won't go out because they don't want to wear a mask. And I, I understand it; they're not comfortable. Um, but then you got the audience in the middle that want to do something, and it's just shrunk our audience by two thirds. Yeah. So we're trying to build that back up, so you know you're safe when you go out. But that's probably one a, a wonderful concert coming up. If you want to come to the Campbell House before the end of March, you'll see the Young People's Fine Arts Festival, which is showcasing 311 pieces of artwork from kids in kindergarten through 12th grade. And we've been doing this for 20-some years. It was an art teacher that had us do this. It was Cheryl Stuckey came to me and said, why can't my students you know, show their work at the Campbell House? So we made that happen. And we do other things. We have a grant for organizations, grants for individual artists. We have an art scholarship that the deadline was last week, and we get people going to Parsons School of Design, SCAD, uh, New York Film Institute as middle and high school students to see if that's something they want to pursue. And we give out five or $6,000 each year um, in, in classical ballet. It's any art form they may be interested in. Okay. And... I guess the last thing I wanted to let you know, if anybody um, has an old instrument or an instrument not being used for band or orchestra, or you have art supplies that you're not using, you, we have a uh, musical instrument drive and an art supply drive. And it's all year round. You can bring them into the camp house anytime. Okay. And we've given out over, ooh, I want to say over 100 instruments to kids who cannot afford them and art supplies to the art teacher. And they come in and they raid Kate's mm -hmm. uh, office because it's all over the place. So there's a lot of things we're doing, but you can just learn more at moreart.org. Yeah, I want to um, <clears throat> encourage people to go to your website, mm -hmm. um, moreart.org. Yes, sir. Um, 
Yeah, it's, a, it's a very nice website. There, mm -hmm. Lots of information. Yes. People <laughs> should familiarize themselves with right. the Arts Council yep. and um, invite them to stop by and just see what a beautiful building yeah, please. you're in. It'll just be an eye opener. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you both um, for coming in, Ellen. It was a pleasure. Thank you for um, having us. We, I am going to be in charge of the seats for your, your <laughs> lecture. And make sure everybody gets a seat. Uh, Chris, it's always good to see you. You too, Bill. Thank um, you. 2022 is starting off on a good note, and we mm -hmm. hope it continues yes, throughout thanks. the year. It's been a long two years. <laughs> uh, the Arts Council of Moore County, the lecture series, starts on March the 23rd at the Sand Hills Community College. Information on the website. We'll give you more information on the other three. Thanks for uh, joining us, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank uh, you for having us. This is All Things Moore County. Have a great week. <laughs>